Perfect. So I'm seeing that there's already a good um, a good crowd here uh, that logged in. Andrew, good to have you. Greg, thanks for joining. Good having you here. Ron is here. Uh, Doron, thanks for joining, man. It's an honor to have you. Simon, how are you doing, my friend? Thanks for joining. Uh, and I think there are a couple other uh, people who are joining right now, uh, but we're going to get started. Uh, so first of all, thanks for joining. Um, uh, just like the title say, this is a close protection seminar, and we're going to talk about advanced work. So um, advanced work, uh, if you're not familiar with that, I'm not talking about work that is so advanced that it's not basic work. I'm talking about uh, in the process of close protection, doing advanced work means kind of um, uh, preparations or um, ahead of time activities on a location prior to an event, a meeting, or anything else that uh, your principal is, um, is going to attend. And so we're going to be talking about advanced work. We're going to be covering some, uh, some of the, the concepts that, um, uh, that I think are most relevant to, you know, keep it in this time frame, but to, to kind of share some knowledge and, and also um, we'll be open to, to questions and answers. Um, and um, I'm sure it'll be very fruitful for everybody. All right, just taking some... Um, <clears throat> more technical stuff here. All right, perfect. So, um, first of all, guys, um, let's talk about uh, Tactical Fitness. Uh, Tactical Fitness Austin, um, uh, we primarily focus on training. We uh, provide training for um, uh, private security companies, for law enforcement, and uh, also for civilians. Uh, we have our open enrollment courses uh, on various subjects. Um, and so... Uh, Tactical Fitness was founded by uh, Ron Grobman. This is uh, approximately 2016, and we've been providing training in, in the U.S., but also in other countries around the globe. And obviously, you know, we're in the midst of uh, expanding our operations even more. Um, a little bit about us. So, um, like I said, uh, Ron's our, our founder. Um, and uh, CEO, uh, John Wayne Taylor, the real life John Wayne, just like the name suggests. And he um, uh, primarily focuses on uh, long range shooting and medical courses. Um, super knowledgeable guy. He's also very knowledgeable in security. Uh, and then uh, I am the latest addition to the team and I focus on Everything has to do with private security training, uh, law enforcement, as well as the, as the private training. And I guess the second aspect of uh, tactical fitness that we cover um, is also the security consulting. Uh, and so part of our uh, operations revolve ab around um, security, threat assessments, um, manpower consultation in terms of uh, hiring uh, agents or um, uh, carrying out also penetration testing and other services that we can provide for corporations, companies, or also uh, contract for other private security companies. Um, I'm just going to go over uh, briefly my personal background as it relates to uh, the subject of this uh, seminar today. Um, I, I was born in Mexico City and I moved to Israel after high school. How I went to do that, guys, I always tell this, life is uh, stranger than fiction. 
it is certainly a subject for um, for a long conversation. So if you ever uh, meet me for a beer, I'll tell you the story. But I'm going to spare you those details now. Uh, and when I got to Israel, this was in late 2003. Um, and then uh, in 2004, I drafted into the military there. And so I stayed in, in active duty throughout uh, different uh, positions in the armed forces all the way up to uh, 2021. So just last year, I, 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 I retired from active duty and I came here to the U.S. Um, to work for Tactical Fitness. And obviously, guys, to chase the American dream. Highly recommend it. Um, so in, uh, my IDF experience uh, began in the infantry. And then I was also a member of a recon battalion. And then um, a big part of my career I spent then in the security agency, uh, close protection division. That included uh, time uh, as a um, personal bodyguard for the chief of staff and other dignitaries. I was also um, amongst the first members of the Israeli counter assault team. So that's our counterpart to the U.S. counter assault team. And, um, you know, we, we worked with them a lot uh, every time on um, uh, when dignitaries from the U.S. visit Israel. Um, and then I was also an instructor at the academy for uh, all dignitary protection agents, air marshals, embassy protection, and other units of the uh, close protection division from security agency. Uh, but I decided that it was... Um, you know, I wanted to kind of uh, still uh, take the fight to the bad guys. As you uh, probably well know, security is very uh, mundane and it can be uh, very frustrating not to see the fruit of your work sometimes um, in, you know, in comparison to the work in direct units, direct action units. So I, I went uh, uh, to Israel National Police. I was in the Border Guard Special Operations Group. Uh, Yamas, uh, and that is where I um, finished my active service uh, about a year ago, and now I'm here talking to you guys. All right, so that's a little bit about my experience. In terms of uh, close protection, like I said, uh, I had the benefit of being um, an agent uh, and then uh, work with uh, different uh, principles of a very interesting schedules. Uh, one of the things I mention always is, hey, uh, not everyone has the same schedule or itinerary or um, a routine, and that really affects the life that you have as an agent, as a, as a protector. So uh, in my case, uh, um, my first uh, detail was in the IDF's Dignitary Protection Unit, and that's where um, I was uh, tasked of uh, protecting the chief of staff and the itinerary of a chief of staff is very interesting one. So if I was to compare that to, let's say, a politician, a member of Congress or, you know, a CEO of a company, uh, you could expect a routine that goes from home to work, back home or, you know, maybe something social, weekends with the family and stuff like that. But a chief of staff of the armed forces has a very different itinerary. Uh, what that means is you could start your day in uh, a war zone, literally, and then move to another country in a secret flight to come back, uh, go to uh, meetings in, in secret bases or in a, a other locations, meet with all sorts of a, uh, important people and dignitaries from other countries as well. Uh, take part in military uh, trainings and operations. So it, it's very varied. Uh, what that meant most of, uh, most of the times, it's, uh, it was uh, entertaining, it was relentless, and we had to carry with us approximately six um, um, changes of clothes, you know, just to make sure you can adapt to whatever the situation is, even, even sports, even working out. I mean, obviously, these individuals are, are highly um, active. And, you know, even at the, 
uh, advanced stages, they remain active and, and they remain uh, training. So you also have to be ready for that. And, and, and that was part of it. So it was a very interesting time. Uh, and then obviously as a counter assault team, I, I had the chance to fly uh, with uh, the Prime Minister of Israel to Africa in several locations and, and other uh, high-risk areas uh, within Israel and the West Bank. Uh, that was also very interesting, very uh, rewarding uh, to, to work with other counter-assault teams around the world. If it's uh, you know, in Kenya or um, uh, Rwanda and other countries and and part of a also the work i did in the the interpretation unit before the counter assault team uh, was fly with um, uh, high-ranking generals or dignitaries to other countries around the world that was also very interesting i'll mention some of the uh, some of the key takeaways from that in uh, some of the later later parts of this presentation now training the agents obviously was very special um, I, I am by nature um, someone who seeks to teach to to pass knowledge to others and so um, you know that, that's very rewarding and, and it also allows you to really uh, cement all the the essentials the fundamentals of, of the work that you do because you get to repeat it all the time and teach others how to do it uh, so I think it's an excellent way of really uh, gaining a higher level in a certain possessions to become a teacher. Um, and you also get to see, obviously, from everything that's happening, you, you get to see the big picture of things. And it was um, a priceless experience, of course. All right. Um, let's get into uh, part of the content that we have today. And, and before we, we, we start going over advanced work procedures, I, I just want to manage some of the expectations here. Uh, first of all, like I mentioned, I am uh, currently, you know, to be completely transparent with you guys, um, uh, transitioning from government work into what's the private sector work. And, and, and as all of you know, um, uh, there are fundamental differences between both. Uh, on the other hand, um, what you also need to understand is that this seminar today, uh, we're not going to go over a specific qualification or requirements for a specific detail. We're going to cover fundamentals and we're going to talk on, 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 on a wide perspective about concepts that are relevant to any type of close protection. All right. So I think that's, that's important for you guys to, to keep in mind. Um, we're not necessarily going to talk about single man operations. Um, so I'll just kind of like talk about that um, on certain parts, of course, but I, I will just refer to that. This is not intended uh, as, a, um, as a work frame for a single man uh, operation. And like I said, we're going to discuss uh, fundamental concepts and we're going to talk about, you know, certain ways of doing things, but not the only ways of doing anything, right? So I'm a, I'm a big believer on in always being a student, I'm a big believer in um, uh, always uh, understanding that there's someone better than you and that there's uh, much to learn from anyone else. All right, so, um, I mean, when we talk about fundamentals, basics of uh, advanced work, really this is what most... Um, companies, most schools, or most uh, education online is going to provide to you. Um, we're going to have to go over routes, obviously, and we're going to have to have some sort of a contact person. We have to coordinate uh, our activities. And uh, that seems pretty obvious. Um, what I really consider this is, is more of a advanced work. I really consider this uh, part of Intel gather, gathering for, for your advanced work. Uh, because, you know, without the information that I can receive from my uh, contact person or my counterpart, uh, wherever I'm, I'm going to, so that I can't really build my, my security plan. I can't really build... A security operation without it. So, uh, 
uh, as part of this Intel Intel gathering stage uh, initially. Well, like we said, Roots is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, you're, you're going to have to analyze your your, your um, available routes to reach, you know, your next uh, destination, your next location. And when I talk about contact, uh, first of all, it might also mean coordinating this event, right? So whatever you're going to uh, take a part of. And in some cases, um, not coordinating might even be the best way to go. In some cases, if you're able to appear in a restaurant, appear in a in a hotel, appear in a in a different uh, or in your next location without any heads up, without anyone being able to to understand that you're going to be there uh, due to reservations or or any other type of a, a public announcement that you you could make. Uh, well, then that that might be a, a, a good call. That might be a good a good step. Um, with regards to mitigating uh, potential threats uh, that may arise from the ability of uh, planning against you and your principal. Um, in terms of contact, so some of the major things that are essential for you to, to, kind, of a, a, to kind of get uh, information about is certainly um, the intel, so kind of like history on um, whatever it is that you're uh, covering now. Uh, that means if I'm, um, if I'm coming to a hotel or a restaurant, so I'm not only talking about Intel on the specific location, but the area that you're going on to. And there, there are several uh, apps and uh, news networks that are uh, free and that you can access to, to, to get this information, certainly in the United States. Um, and so abroad, I, I am more familiar. There, there's many companies that offer this type of information uh, that you can make use of. Uh, but Intel about a location can even be just, you know, discussing with the, my contact person what's, you know, what happened here today, next day, what's going on. Not even from a security perspective, but just in terms of like what they're going through. And as you guys uh, probably know, uh, some of the information you might receive from, receive from that may not seem to this contact person as security relevant, but to you, it may very well uh, represent a security concern or uh, major information uh, for you to keep in mind. Uh, another thing that's extremely important is to verify the itinerary. All right. So as a as a young agent, uh, many times um, during advance work or uh, or sorry, not being part of advanced, advanced, advanced work, but showing up with my principal, uh, you realize how much uh, community, uh, communication discrepancies appear within the security team and the coordinating, um, you know, or the executive team. And, and so these itineraries, you know, uh, usually are kept for personal assistance and they're kept for... Um, you know, a specific contacts within the, the host or, or the event that you're gonna be part of. And, you know, obviously your, your work uh, trying to bridge that gap is essential, uh, but I would say it's a good redundancy to uh, make sure that you can confirm the itinerary uh, with your contact person and, and I'm talking, by the way, advanced work uh, that we're discussing now, just to, to make sure everybody's in the same picture. Um, this is, I'm talking about a, a process that you're going to go through an hour to a few hours before an event. So these are more uh, immediate uh, events or, or, or meetings or, or uh, you know, programs on the schedule, uh, more so than just you know, uh, showing up uh, two weeks in advance for a trip abroad. And, and meeting uh, different contacts. So, so I'm, I'm talking about on the spot, you know, an hour and a half hour before your principal shows, like, hey, verify this itinerary, um, you know, because there may have been changes also that weren't reported to you. Now, in terms of the local uh, information that uh, you'll want to gather from your contact, uh, um, I mean, the, the fairly obvious one is, hey, entry points, exit points, um, you know, where can we see it 
Uh, where can we wait? Where the amenities? Amenities, um, I, I always remember uh, one of my first assignments with the chief of staff uh, and as, um, as, as the primary. Uh, you know, you don't realize this when you're young, but you know, the, 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 suddenly the, the chief of staff turns around and tells me, hey, where's the bathroom? And I had no idea. So, uh, you know, I, you get caught with your, with your pants down in that moment. And, and this is uh, things that during advanced work, gathering that type of information, communicating if you have a team to the rest of the team, obviously, uh, is essential, you know, to keep efficiency and uh, to avoid this type of, a, of situation. So all amenities are necessary, you know, the, in terms of bathrooms, in terms of uh, everything else you can think of at that location that's going to be necessary. Uh, for instance, uh, hotels, uh, if we're going for a conference in a hotel, or well, maybe we'll need a resting room or resting area uh, you're going to have to find, and so on and so forth. In terms of other aspects that are important here, the workers, okay? The workers um, who is uh, working at this location, and I, I, I think hotels and restaurants are particularly, um, you know, uh, areas where you're going to want to you're going to want to understand who's working there. Uh, obviously, working in the Middle East where it's very clear uh, the amount of threats that you can have that come from a political perspective, um, this is, a, is a very common. But even from just um, a criminal perspective, to be able to, to understand the type of individuals that, that are uh, surrounding you know, your event or that are taking part of this, are, uh, is extremely important, right? Um, so to give you an example from a big level operation, uh, uh, and if you look at American Secret Service, I mean, uh, these guys, uh, they don't even, uh, you know, they don't even uh, offer local food to their, um, to their principal. So, so the, the Secret Service will travel with um, food and cooks and, and all the supplies needed to provide that food. And if there's an event that requires uh, that principal to eat food from someone else, uh, from the host, then there is a whole operation around uh, scanning, testing, planning, and preventing any uh, potential attack or sabotage to that food, obviously, right? Um, but the way you approach this in a smaller scale, all right, if I have to do it, for instance, if my, my principal is someone who um, is very highly recognizable, maybe highly antagonistic, and, and, and you know, one of the, the people in this restaurant where I'm going at might recognize him and, and try to do something in, in the food, for instance, uh, well, I, I need to create some sort of a creative way of at least getting a, an impression of people I'm going to work with, all right? And, and then, so this brings me to another point we're going to discuss later on. I'm going to talk about a little bit of creativity, a little bit of a flexibility in your thinking, but, um, you know, and you guys can write on the comments if you want ideas about this stuff. Um, but uh, one of the, the main, uh, the main, uh, you, uh, options that you could use is, is uh, from the beginning, not presenting yourself uh, as, a, as a security officer, but presenting yourself as a personal coordinator, a personal assistant, and then requesting, for example, uh, to check uh, the, the status, the cleanliness, the, the health status of, of the kitchen. And then, uh, you know, based on the sensitivities of your client, uh, being given access to, to this kind of like more restricted areas uh, to be able to at least get an impression of, of what you're, what you're against, against, right? If you, you have that uh, perspective, that profiling of, of, of seeing something that's, uh, that just doesn't sit well for you, well, then that's an opportunity to, to, to get that exposure, you know, and, and get that, that uh, access for you to determine that. Um, and so these are uh, kind of like the, the main, the essential, but, but I, again, I call this intelligence gathering really because we're just taking uh, into perspective all this information 
to be able to create um, our security plan. Right? And so this brings us to our next step. Hold on a second. Where um, we're talking about macro and micro strategies. And if you, have a, if you guys have questions, please write them down and we're going to have a section on questions uh, at the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, so keep your questions and, and we'll be answering them uh, shortly. Um, so my overall event strategy, after I have all that intel that I gathered, all right, from, from everything we did before, uh, I'm going to create my overall event strategy. That means, hey, where am I going to uh, disembark my, cl my client? Where am I going to embark him at the end of the operation? Where is he going to sit? Where is he going to wait? Um, and, and, you know, all of this is, is going to be... Uh, very, I would say this is the, the most essential part of your advanced work because it's also based on your experience and your ability to interpret uh, the best decisions that you can make on the spot. And, um, you know, it, it, your, your really your, your experience and ability as a, as a, as a security professional, advanced work uh, professional, uh, you'll be able to determine... Uh, an operational plan for the event um, that is the most efficient, you know, in terms of security. But we're again talking in a macro level, so more of like an overall um, approach to the event itself, uh, which will include, hey, where are my embark and disembark points? What are my internal routes? Uh, what is my seeking, speaking, waiting, a, um, waiting a location? And what is my secure room? Right, so then, uh, based on the itinerary, based on the intel, and based on what you've seen, you have to determine that overall event strategy plan. And some of the things that you have to keep in mind is 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 the balance, right? So seeking balance between complete security and also allowing uh, your um, your protectee to to go about his routine uh, with no. Um, with no interruption, and 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 oftentimes uh, we can uh, forget this, uh, and and you know it's always a seek of balance, which is very very important in, in all aspects, and here's where you're going to have to find that. And so, um, when you determine that operational plan, that overall event strategy, um, we're going to go ahead and and scan or search for. We're going to do an assessment of our con con contextual threats. What I mean by that is, hey, why am I embarking here or disembarking here? Why am I, why am I stopping the car here? Why am I parking here? Why is this my internal route? What are your contextual threats? Right? So if a contextual threat is uh, just the environment, like uh, criminal activity, well, maybe I'm going to reduce exposure to that and choose a different uh, disembarking point to reach my event, right? So, so and these things are, are fairly obvious to the developed security mind, but uh, it's important to, to, to approach it in a systematic way where, I'm, uh, where you need to determine which are these contextual uh, threats that you face, and then based on that, make the decisions that are part of this uh, overall event strategy. Um, Internal routes, well, not only my threats, but also the convenience of the, my clients. And then seating, speaking, and waiting. Uh, and these are things that uh, should be also, um, um, you know, not too complicated to understand. But obviously, you know, keep to best practices with regards to, for instance, choosing a table uh, to sit for a meal, uh, for a meeting in a public place, a hotel room in a hotel. Not every table and not every hotel room is, um, you know, a good security from a security perspective, right? Um, and then my secure room. What I mean by secure room is usually a room that we're going to use as part of a, a temporary uh, evacuation plan. We're going to get into that right now into our micro strategies, the sectional emergency planning. But this secure room is something that we need as maybe a transitional spot from full evacuation, right? From full um, execution of, 
of getting that client out of that place in case of emergency. And so uh, this brings us really to the next uh, section, which is the sectional emergency plan. And according to all, we need to divide our event strategy, our overall strategy. We're going to have to section it out in sections according to the specific locations that you're going to be going to based on the itinerary. And then according to that, we'll create a sectional emergency plan. Sectional emergency plan, for example, um, if I am to, you know, bring up an example from, um, you know, working with a, a principal that may have a, a small security team with him. Uh, so I'm talking about, hey, what are our most vulnerable points, obviously, which we're all aware of, you know, embarking, disembarking, entry, exits. Um, but also within the, the, the limits of our uh, infrastructure, the limits of uh, our internal routes reaching our sitting area or speaking area or waiting area, um, we need to incorporate uh, an emergency plan for that section, right? And so sometimes what that can look like is, you know, in case of uh, an attack, an emergency, my, my first step is going to be to maybe take over under the table, provide some sort of containment, and then evac to that secure room, which is the closest area where I can be uh, and take cover and kind of like uh, provide more resilience until I can, um, you know, uh, get, get help or uh, contain this threat and then move to uh, leaving the location probably on the car or, or maybe allow for law enforcement and other, um, um, and other players to, to, to come into that location. Um, but it's also dependent on, your, on what is mostly available, what is more immediately available. And so we're going to see a video um, later on about some French uh, dignitary protection team. And I mean, I thought it was fairly obvious, but if, if I'm closer to the car than I am to my location to, or to the building or, or infrastructure that we're going to be entering, um, then my first point of evac is going to be the car and not the entry of the building and vice versa. So if I'm closer to that building, I'll actually want to reach that building with my... Uh, a principal first rather than going back to the car all right now all this uh, uh, you know fairly very basic knowledge of, of keeping a door open keeping the car on um, it's not always possible I know when you're working on a one-man security team uh, but uh, you know we have to interpret this from from different perspectives so even if you're alone um, you uh, what I'm referring to is hey which cover am I going to use first? So maybe I can use the cover of the car or I can use the cover of entering uh, that structure, right? So, so it's, it's something that we need to adapt to all levels, but the principles are the same. And so this is what I uh, refer to our sectional emergency planning because I'm going to create that type of a step uh, response uh, planning for every section of the event. And, and the planning is, it revolves around attacks and it revolves around your ability to uh, neutralize that threat, contain the area, and evac your principal to the nearest secure room or cover location. All right, so I hope uh, that was clear to you guys. It's a very key, important point. Uh, we're going to talk also now about more like a, your critical mindset and advanced tools uh, that you have here on a, um, as part of the advanced work and as part of what we uh, you know wanted to provide here on this on this seminar and what I call uh, let's begin with what I call the astute protector skills um, that's going to be flexibility first of all and flexibility by the way in North America and some places in Europe is not as common in the ingrained in a person's mindset as it is um, in other areas such as Israel, such as other areas of uh, maybe, um, um, you know, Eastern Europe and, um, and um, the Middle East. 
because flexibility uh, is also something that you can get used to. It's also something that gives power of your character, of your culture norms. And um, that is one of the biggest advantages, I think, of uh, Israeli armed forces in general, is the ability to be flexible on the spot at any moment, whereas uh, other countries, other uh, armed forces, other security operations uh, are very limited by uh, the speed, the um, ease of um, adapting okay, to different um, changes in, in whatever you had uh, planned. And, um, and just to, you know, to bring an example, I mean, this can be, hey, we're coming out of this restaurant from a meeting and suddenly my principal sees a store uh, where he can get something that he just right now decided he wants to get. You know, how do I approach this? And, and how do I train for this? So you have to train that flexibility. And if you're working a team, you'll have to uh, train this flexibility together, right? So in that moment, for instance, well, maybe I don't need to do advanced work in this ice cream shop that my principal just saw, you know, across the, the parking lot of the mall. But maybe I need my driver to understand that he can drive next to us and provide that additional uh, a cover as, we, as we're moving towards this ice cream place, right? Uh, or I can, if I have other members of my team, maybe I can position them in the way or position them in, a, in, in a specific uh, locations along the route or, or perhaps a where perhaps they can get a, an, a wider perspective, you know, of, of other threats that could arise during this, this new uh, part of the itinerary. Um, I think creativity, resourcefulness, and um, is going to relate to covert uh, security operations and covert security planning. Uh, this seminar is not uh, focused on covert security planning, but... Uh, it's certainly um, something that we're going to mention as a, as critical, I think, for uh, for this type of operations. And and what I'm talking about here is um, well, like I mentioned before, okay. So if, if 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 you need to gather as much intel as you can, and it begins from there, how am I gathering this, right? Like uh, maybe if I want to uh, prevent that type of uh, public knowledge, well, how do I um, reserve a location without uh, mentioning my client's name? How do I uh, uh, get as much intel as I can from my point of contact without presenting myself as a security officer? Uh, it starts there. And then you can use that result for the, that creativity if you enhance it more uh, to even doing a, a, you know, a huge part of the advanced work from a covert perspective. Maybe I can uh, pose uh, or create a cover story for myself where I'm going to be able to explore all the points and all the, the critical um, uh, steps of my advanced work that we discussed. Uh, and and so, so that's something to consider. Uh, and I will mention also in the end that we have a specific training for that. Uh, that we provide for private security companies and, and law enforcement units that also deal with the, some of that. Uh, and now what I want to talk about is kind of like advanced strategy skills uh, or tools. Um, again, guys, I believe that the basics need to be mastered for you to be uh, efficient. I, I, I kind of like abide by what Bruce Lee said here I fear not the man who knows 10,000 different kicks, but I fear more the man who knows one kick and has practiced it 10,000 times. Um, so a routine break, uh, uh, what I'm referring to here is our roots, right? So routine break, and I'm not talking, I specifically didn't call it deception because it needs to be random. It cannot be something that is created by your own mindset and... Um, and, um, and, and, you know, something that you could, um, I guess, uh, plan on your own that someone could interpret and someone could um, maybe understand that you're going to do that. It needs to be random. So at the level of doing uh, routine breaking your roots, um, 
I mean, this can even be done in an app. You can even leave that to artificial intelligence to determine which route you're going to take. Uh, and uh, I, I hope that the, the difference okay, between deception and routine break uh, is clear to you because when I do deception, I'm still predictable to some extent um, if my adversary is very familiar with me. Uh, but routine break is really not dependent on me. So I prefer leaving that to artificial intelligence. And routine break, um, you know, a story that I can uh, bring up to you guys is uh, in Turkey many years ago. And I used to train the embassy protection units. Um, and in Turkey a few years ago, uh, the ambassador was under threat from uh, Hezbollah's uh, international uh, kind of like special operations uh, assassination group. And what they wanted to do was uh, put an IED in a bicycle that was parked in a choke point along a, one of the routes that this ambassador used. And really, routine break saved him because um, uh, that day, uh, from that routine break in route, uh, he was able to avoid that. Additional to that, uh, a decoy, so deception, in this case, used together with routine break, um, uh, was used on the route that had the ID, and uh, fortunately, the ambassador was not hit. Right, deception and concealment, I think, are are major, um, uh, major tools that you need to use in your in your tool set. And let me mention, guys, um, a, I had in one occasion, a, I flew with a high-ranking member of the Israel Defense Forces to a visit in Colombia. Um, Chile and um, well I think that was it Colombia and Chile in Latin America and it was a really great experience I and mean, when we landed in Colombia it was just me and this, this uh, high ranking general and we received a local team of uh, Colombian uh, uh, soldiers so I received this, this like battalion of soldiers that just rode behind us in the truck and then motorcycles riding on the sides with, um, uh, you know, with micro uh, Uzis and things like that, uh, uh, protecting us on turns and everything. It was a really fantastic experience, uh, very cool. But the, the lack of uh, communication with the Colombian team, and I speak Spanish, obviously, but uh, still the lack of a uh, common ground with them and the lack of knowledge that I could get from them, the intel that I could get from them, uh, really caused me to rely uh, heavily on on deception and concealment and so my general he was a very active man like I said he had to go run in the morning and we're in the middle of Bogota uh, in a hotel that is surrounded by soldiers so it's obvious that there is some sort of VIP there um, uh, these soldiers are also not people I can uh, trust like I have no idea uh, who they are, what level, who they work for, really, you know. There's also obviously a lot of corruption in Latin America and, and many other countries around the world. Um, so, you know, this guy, I wanted to go for a run. And um, what I identified to our advantage was that a big part also of this uh, battalion or security team that was assigned to us um, didn't really um, see us well. Like, they, they couldn't really... Uh, recognize uh, who we are, or what we really look like. Obviously, we, we, we looked different in general, but um, some of them also changed uh, shifts throughout the night and things. So, so it wasn't obvious to them who they were even guarding. And so in the morning, what we did is I, during my advance work, or uh, even when I, I, in this case, I was alone. So I, once we reached the hotel, I kind of uh, um, carried out parts of the intel gathering after the fact of reaching the hotel. And so I identified the additional exit points of the hotel through an underground parking lot. And I decided that we were gonna go for a run without telling anybody and just like exiting the hotel from a point that wasn't guarded. And indeed, uh, we were able to exit that hotel, run in the middle of the street in Bogota, and then come back to the hotel and, and no one really knew that we did that. So that, that turned out to be extremely efficient uh, for this type of operation and and that's why you know that's just one example but deception and concealment are are extremely extremely important 
Another example of a concealment is um, well, one of the higher dignitaries in Israel. Uh, I was part of an operation where um, he was uh, it was a he he was taken uh, to a hospital for a medical check that uh, the I mean he did not want this to be public, right? So. The media is an individual that, you know, whatever he does or, or, or wants to do is on the media constantly uh, monitored. So moving him to kind of like receive this service and back to wherever he was in a concealed way uh, was very interesting and very efficient as well. All right. And then uh, the last aspect I want to discuss with you guys as part of our critical mindset advanced tools is, uh, and I, I kind of put it together, but containment, uh, containment is... Uh, being able to really gain control of, of, an, of a specific area and kind of a gain superior awareness uh, to provide me with an advantage within that area. And so uh, containment uh, is relevant also to location choice because it's uh, location, my location might produce uh, or might make this containment easier or harder. And then... Uh, Getting that hyper awareness, hyper focus, I think is essential uh, in terms of once you've, you know, if you want to gain that containment and maintain it. I'm going to see an example now of uh, how that uh, did not work for uh, uh, in one of the videos I'm going to show you. So, um, the first uh, kind of case that I want to discuss here is the Shinzo Abe case. And uh, Shinzo Abe, a former prime minister of uh, Japan, uh, was killed, uh, assassinated a few weeks ago in, uh, in Napa, Japan. This is the Yamato Saidaji railway station. Uh, I took a picture here on Google Earth. You guys can see a, a, a black circle in the middle of the picture. And that is the location where he was giving a speech when he was killed. And so uh, what I want to discuss here it's kind of a, that concept of location, containment, and micro strategies. Because this, by the way, this little map marked here with the crowd, crowd, location of Chinzo. Um, I took this from Mickey Weinberg, okay, CEO of Tarantula. Uh, I had the privilege of a, a working and training with him in Israel when I was in the Dignity Protection Unit. And so I just wanted to give credit to him because he made this and I, I just uh, posted it here on the presentation. Look him up on LinkedIn, very knowledgeable guy. Um, and so you can see, first of all, from, from the location that they chose for the speech, well, it's really in the middle of the street, right? And so um, obviously the, the norms, the culture, the kind of like the best practices that, that people have in, in Japan are obviously not the same as you may uh, have here in uh, North America or in the Middle East or in other places, um, I think personally that they actually, uh, from my opinion, there's, there's probably two two factors that 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 uh, brought them to choose this location. Number one is probably this is a location they've used repeatedly. In my opinion, I, I can't tell you 100%, but I think they've used this location repeatedly, and it's kind of like that. Uh, you know, that, that sickness of, hey, we've done it like this always, so why should we change this now? And the other thing I think they might have thought is that it actually provided some sort of natural containment from the crowd because uh, cars were not uh, stopped. Like, they were able to drive around the location. As a new, uh, and as you can see, there are uh, barricades, uh, you know, traffic barricades located around uh, Shinzo Abe during his speech. So I think maybe in their mind, this provided some sort of containment from the crowd. Uh, but as you can see from what happened, I mean, our attacker was in one of the crowd positions, uh, kind of like the southern corner, and was able to move and close distance towards the speech area to about eight yards, if I'm not mistaken, from our, uh, our principal and, and kill him. And now another thing that I, so, so, you know, the containment was not managed properly, right? So even, even if they thought they had containment, they did not manage that containment well. And then another thing that really surprised me here is um, 
the reaction of the agents, right? So we can see the micro strategy of a kind of like their emergency response when, when the shooting starts, uh, the primary and the other agents that are located, in, located near the former president, uh, they try to bring him down to the ground and cover him with uh, Kevlar, uh, um, Kevlar um, folding packs. Uh, but then the reaction, you can see on the top left image, this is the first man who reached the attacker. And by the way, he's one of the only men that I saw armed from all the pictures that I was able to, to gather about this uh, event. And he did not choose to shoot and neutralize the threat, rather tackled uh, uh, this man who was armed with a gun. And he not only tackled him, uh, but he ran a approximately eight or nine yards to reach him and then tackle him. So, um, you know, it's unfortunate. I think it's part of a, a you know, the results of a culture that is um, unfamiliar with firearms, unfamiliar with violence, and uh, that created overconfidence and overcomfort in that sense. Uh, but, you know, I, this is, just, uh, I don't like to be that, that, uh, that armback, uh, you know, quarterback just saying, hey, they, they could be doing this, doing that. But uh, what I like is that, hey, we can learn from this and try to do it better. And I hope, obviously, that uh, the Japanese uh, uh, dignity protection units really learn from this event and, and make it much better. All right. And uh, what, another thing I want to show you guys here is... Uh, a video of a lack of containment and lack of focus. And so let's take a look at this video. Hopefully I'll be able to play it. Um, of course, of course I'm not able to play it. Let me see if uh, maybe there's something I'm doing wrong. All right, so I, I actually prepared for this and hopefully I'll be able to show you guys this video here. Um, so I'm gonna add it to uh, the view here. You should be able to see it. Um, but there's a delay here. I'll try to play it again. I'm all right. Well, I'm not sure that you guys saw the video, or, or I hope you did. Uh, the system that I'm using doesn't uh, let me see exactly what everybody's watching, but. Um, uh, on this video, what you can see is we're on, on disembark or embark, sorry, to, to the car. Disembark. They park the car, open the door. Our uh, VIP is coming out of the door. We have an agent, the primary there, who's uh, receiving the, our, our dignitary coming out of the car. This guy completely loses focus and he's just shaking hands with his body. At that time, uh, our adversary, who's not contained, uh, identifies an opportunity and reaches him. I think he he cracked an egg on his face or something like that. Uh, but it doesn't matter. I mean, this could have been a knife on the face. It can be also someone shooting you in the head uh, or throwing a grenade in your car. It's not, uh, that's not what matters. What matters here is uh, the lack of containment and the lack of focus, which as you can see, we're talking about basic stuff. Like you could be thinking of them saying, hey, that's obvious to me. Like what the hell? But these guys uh, are at the highest level of security uh, in a European country, and um, it can happen to anyone, you know, uh, if you don't maintain that, uh, uh, that mastery of your fundamentals. And, and really, we see that also in tactical training, and we see that in, in almost every aspect of other things that, that we covered. So, 
we're going to uh, talk about questions now. I'm going to uh, check you guys out on, on the, the LinkedIn uh, event link. And if you guys want to post comments there, you can post a comment on, um, on, on, the, on the thread of the invitation here. If you're able to post a comment on, if you're able to post a comment somewhere else, then then, then do it, and hopefully I'll be able to see your your comments and your questions. Well, I don't really see a lot of questions here. Must have been really good, my presentation. No one had questions about it. Anyhow, uh, I'm also looking at your comments, guys, on the page of uh, on Tactical Fitness, on the, on the, on the webinar uh, link page. Um, so feel free to post your question there. Uh, I'm going to give it another few seconds to see if I uh, see any questions pop up. If not, and I see them afterwards, uh, I'll follow up with you and, and send you an answer to your question, of course. Uh, you, can, you guys can also reach me at any moment, uh, any time, and, and, and ask me something. And so because we're also, a, a, um, we started a little late, uh, we're gonna what I want to cover here is some of the courses that we offer here in Tactical Fitness. Uh, when we talk about training, all right, so I'm not talking so much about services of a consulting and penetration testing and, and, and so on and so forth, but I'm talking about courses uh, that we offer uh, for agents and for private security companies. And um, we're really focused on three uh, main categories. So our first category is close protection fundamentals. And that means, hey, what are your abilities uh, in terms of third party protection uh, when it comes to uh, small arms, edge weapons, when it comes to um, you know, certain attacks at medium, short and even long distances and how well can you neutralize that threat and how well can you um, uh, evac your principal to the car or to your secure room or secure location right so we also teach uh, on this course um, our combat timeline uh, we teach uh, we're going to focus on how to walk with your principal how to adapt yourself to uh, the contextual threat that is constantly shifting uh, with regards to what you have presented in front of you, right? So you may be walking, uh, but you know, in a mall, but the, con the contextual threats that you have during that event keep changing, all right, and keep varying uh, according to what you're doing, right? So if you're coming close to someone, if you're not coming close to someone, if you're coming to a new um, a corridor, uh, how do you uh, adapt yourself to make sure that you're covering uh, for unexpected uh, areas and new areas and, uh, uh, and you know, new people that, that get close to your, um, to your principal? And then um, another course that we're offering is also covert protection tactics. Uh, here we cover a realm of, uh, of basics and fundamentals of uh, surveillance and counter surveillance uh, that are dedicated to security work. So they're dedicated to protection, right? Uh, uh, but they're based on surveillance and counter surveillance uh, measures and tactics. And what we cover in this course is how to apply that to your advanced work, how to apply that to uh, driving on your motorcade or driving a, uh, with your client and identifying maybe a surveillance on you. Um, as well as gathering as much intel as you can when you're, when you're carrying out advanced work uh, or other tasks as part of your, uh, of your security detail. And then another uh, uh, very popular training that we carry out is uh, scenario simulation training. And this ranges from active shooter uh, to all sorts of uh, uh, third-party protection uh, scenarios. Um, we even offer uh, some of this training also to civilians uh, considering scenarios where they're protecting their families. And so I think this is one of the most popular uh, courses that we have. 
Um, we uh, do this also with uh, UTM, Force and Force, uh, but uh, depending on the location, uh, you know, we can use uh, other tools and other systems to deliver this type of training. Great. So um, these are just some recommendations that, you, that uh, uh, we added. These are, um, are the format of our presentations, and so we always add uh, uh, some of their recommendations that clients or people that uh, work with me or with Ron uh, uh, or John uh, provide for us. And then uh, I wanted to just finish up here, guys, with some uh, information on how to contact. Right, So you have my email here, a phone number, our website, uh, LinkedIn uh, profile, and Instagram. And um, I wanted to thank you for uh, your time, for being here in the seminar. Uh, I, I think it was uh, very good, and I hope it was uh, fruitful for you. And you know, even if you learned one thing uh, or it opened your mind to something else, I think that that's uh, exactly what I wanted, and I'm glad. Uh, and like I said, uh, everything I discussed uh, within the context of, of the the expectations that we uh, discussed at the beginning of this presentation. I just want to reiterate that, uh, you know, this is one way. It's not the way. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, certain uh, fundamentals and, and bases that I think, um, you know, from my perspective, I wanted to share with you guys. And I'm uh, extremely open in mindset and in uh, intention to learn from anybody. So if you want to communicate with me about things that... Uh, uh, you don't agree with or you have questions about feel free to contact me and um, uh, please uh, give us a follow uh, check our website for upcoming uh, open enrollment courses or contact us about uh, training for your company your private security detail or if you want to do training uh, on your own as an agent who just wants to be more prepared and uh, uh, you know know and become a, a more skillful and more professional in, in what you do. So thanks again, guys, and uh, that's going to be it for now. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Stay safe.